cheap and they work so well. Ah, <sighs> so I want I want to grab a ring light, and um, I could could have potentially did that, but now I just I, I have to store my my summer car away. And that's four hundred bucks. So yeah. Um, every time I think I'm getting ahead, man. So what are you have, what are you driving in the winter? Uh, I drive a, a Volvo a Volvo S sixty. Okay. Yeah. You saw my other car, the Challenger. Yeah, I love the Challenger. Yeah, it's a fun car. Um, we're 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 recording, by the way, so okay. all of this may just be on there. It just it might just happen. Sure. It sound natural. Yeah. Well, our goal or my goal or our mutual goal, whatever you called it, was to talk about the ways because I had the I had the. There is a there is this uh, very advanced bodybuilder for the national. I won't say his name for sake of privacy. That wanted to reduce his waist because uh, I wrote him on Instagram clearly and fairly honestly. I said, uh, if you trim your waist, you will win the overall because he had won the Vancouver show, and uh, he was probably right because he wrote to me, you know. Mm-hmm. But I didn't want to come with you know a very like light answer. I wanted to answer him with the any probable juxtaposition that could occur that will bloat the waist or create aerophagy or create a stomach distension. And uh, it took me almost like a, a week of thinking, uh, rethinking, remembering. And uh, I, I, I chat with amongst the best expert I know to have uh, critics or review or analysis and stuff. And I came out with a pretty decent uh, article. Uh, I like it. It was popular on Instagram. It was shared many, many times. And uh, that's why I send you both, Robin and Mike, uh, the article that we can talk about it, make it more clear because I'm, I'm French. I'm not fully English. And when you talk about the body, it's, it's, it's very hard to transcribe sometimes language to physical reality and sometimes to just speak to it would be much easier that's yeah. my point. yeah so let's dive into it then we'll go point by point so that way you can, that'll be okay. much easier and each oh. of you can answer questions regarding yeah it. yeah and like this is something like you said it's pretty popular amongst bodybuilders like i think everybody wants to have like a small waist or the smallest waist to kind of give them shape and give the illusion that you're much bigger than you are even if you're 300 pounds like our friend robin over there um it's always better to have like a a smaller waist um yeah but so i mean the most common thing people say is like when they think of a bigger waist or like a distended gut they think gh and insulin so like I know you talk about some of that in like the article, but can we address that first? Is that, would you say, is that true or false? Is that the reason why like we're seeing so much distended guts and blown out waste now? Well, you have to think uh, holistically, which is not easy per se. You have to consider that the guts has a gut permeability. There's a CNS gut axis that goes to vagal, to emotional, to biochemistry, to hormonal, to immune function. And yes, it's true somehow, but growth hormone actually uh, repair and doesn't grow per se. It's more of a a positive outcome. And yes, you could maybe uh, inhibit to an extent with growth hormone, but not many people can financially afford it. You know, let's yeah, say yeah. I will need a quarter of a million of growth hormone to look like Coleman. And uh, if you don't, don't have the myostatin count or the genetics for it, it won't, it won't, it won't happen even though I spend that kind of money. So uh, there's this kind of a illusionary drama about the growth hormone reality and stuff. And when it's related to insulin, Yes and no, because it's more the insulino resistance related to uh, thyroid function, uh, adrenal, uh, parathyroid, uh, thyroid. Say it's kind of an overlapping in the uh, 
let's say, the, the complexity of the uh, circadian homeostasis of the body. And uh, some people will do very well with uh, lentils. Some people will do very well with fast insulin. It kind of become a very personalized kind of ratio, uh, scenario, ratio mm -hmm. or modalities. And uh, there's uh, two camps. There's the camp, let's say, of most uh, American guru for uh, pro bodybuilder, mm -hmm. which is eat as much as you can, as much as growth hormone and as much as food, yeah. which is maybe a reality. And there's me, I said, no, 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 no. You can look at Kai Green. He doesn't eat that much. He doesn't, uh, no. Yeah. You can do very well with not eating, fasting, uh, low calories. Uh, an example like John Meadows, you know, doesn't have the best ways, obviously. But, yeah. you know, he was 212, 444. Four, four, and it's a guy, he went down to 14, 1500. Of course, when he cheated, he kind of overblown, which yeah. I don't really like or advise to do so. But uh, there's this uh, American uh, alpha male. I'm going to eat everything and I'll win on impure. I don't really believe in that. I believe in slow, incremental, smart, anti-inflammatory, holistic, very uh, in tune with nature and color and, and, and uh, uh, a physical stature that makes the body evolve and grow at the pace he's willing to. And yeah, I, that's, that's my, my, my side, you know? Yeah. I am right, I am wrong, doesn't matter. I, I don't want to work with Phil Heath. I want to work with people that struggle to look like Phil Heath and maybe they could or maybe they can't. Yeah. And eventually yeah. there's an ego that you say, okay, I won't be able to do that. And yeah. that's yeah. fine. Doesn't yeah. make me less of a person. Yeah, that, I think that's that's better as a coach. I, I say it speaks to coaching when you can take somebody that isn't like a Phil Heath and make them a Phil Heath. Um, but you mentioned John Meadows, and funny enough, I was watching um, Swiss some uh, like these. It's called Swiss Video Flicks. I think me and Robin talked about that before. Uh, I was watching that two days ago, and he was actually talking about GH and insulin, and. Um, you know, the use of it, and it's mostly for repair and whatnot. And from our conversations and from my research, like, I agree that it's more like a repair thing. It's not like people are not going to see these huge gains jumping on GH. Um, but there's this abusive um, uh, behavior around it that like, oh, if I take this, like, I'm going to look like Ronnie Coleman, but probably not even like if you have, you know, a ridiculous amount of cash to spare to use for it. But so, but I wanted to touch I, on. I would say that one GF could technically expand your stomach mm -hmm. in terms of, let's say, one G insulin growth factor LR3 could do it, or Mika Sermon, the, uh, the pharmaceutical uh, one GF1. That could, if you have the one GF receptor in your stomach. If yeah. you look at someone like, uh, what's his name? The guy that had the issues of the Oh, uh, Rodin? Sean, Sean Rodin. Sean Rodin is someone that has a lot of 1GF1 in muscle and very poor 1GF in stomach. He's kind of, the, has the lottery draft of the 1GF. So is, is that like, so is it true that the amount of receptors in your, uh, the 1GF or IGF1 receptors in your stomach kind of dictates how much your stomach is going to grow when you're taking uh, GH or if you're taking directly uh, IGF-1 insulin, things like that? The, 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 this kind of, uh, you, it's kind of you leaving the answer of the genetic. I don't really see the genetic as the outcome per se. I'm more of a, let's say, a, a prenatal uh, practitioner. So what I mean by that is if your mother has trained and eat good in the first, second, and third semester of her life, and she was active, and she was strong, then there, it could be a, a more amniotic fluid and umbilical cord that's prone to 1GF. But at the same time, higher the 1GF, shorter the lifespan. Mm -hmm. So yes, yes, you're more prone to build muscle at the 1GF level, depends 
the androgen, it depends on other factor. At the same time, you will see in higher G, one GF uh, bone morphology, you'll see a space in between teeth, you will see a larger jaw, you will see a, a, a wider uh, width of the clavicle, you'll see, you know. Mm. Mm. You will see in the bone morphology. Um, and you, so you talked about like using Lantis and that will work better with some people and not so well with other people. Why is that? Because it, uh, when you, like, the, when you, like, when you look at it, it's just like, it is what it is, right? The Lantus is going to peak several times throughout the day. I don't think like that Lantus peak per se. It, it will peak if you take too much. The ideology behind Lantus, it's not to actually feel his action. Mm -hmm. Bodybuild, traditional American bodybuilder will say insulin is anabolic. And yeah. BLP in Canada, more maybe, I don't know, conservator, uh, will say, uh, no, uh, insulin is anti-catabolic. And we don't want anabolism, we want anti-catabolism. And you want an anti-catabolism that keep your bloodstream equal, even. Yeah. The disadvantage of Lantus, it could retain some kind of potassium, but be careful on that. That's but it, but it's pushing nutrients to like different. It's pushing nutrients, right, into your body like throughout a long duration throughout the day, yeah. and you don't know. You can't determine whether that those nutrients, those you know, that energy, those calories, or whatever you want to call them, are going to fat cells or muscle. So why wouldn't it be more ad advantageous to use something where I can contain when I want it to spike. I train yeah. my muscle, it's in demand, there's blood going to it. Now I want to, I want to repair it. I want to drive protein through it. I need the uh, glycogen to carry that protein and proliferate the cells, blah, 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 blah. Like now yeah. let me like shoot this thing rather than like the, the, I eat the, all day. Comparison, the comparison you're laying out is you're laying out the probability of nature and now me, I'm laying out the probability of an enhanced athlete that need to eat more than what a, a pancreas can handle. So it's more of a precautionary measure of we're going to prioritize anti-catabolism, second, glycemic mm. signaling, so you eat low glycemic even though you're on lentus. You could have fruit, you know, glucogen for liver before training. Mm. You could technically sleep maybe if you want low body composition with raw honey, that would be fine. But you kind of keep a low glycemic state. Mm. Uh, sure. Some American like very high glycemic post-workout. I don't really like it because most people I know, they don't look better, they look worse, you know? Uh, but that's what about a, What about a from a recovery standpoint? Maybe they don't look any better, but are they recovering the more thing from is, like the a thing workout? Is that's another fight. Now you're bringing another fight. Is the fight of the molecular research where there's a lot of money that look at the immediate reaction and there's the functional medicine that don't have money that looks at what does do high glycemic post workout over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Do you care about the now or you care the long extent? It doesn't matter. The long extent will show how you look and we're bodybuilding look so we care long term yeah so you're saying like long term like those intro workouts or pre-workout those high carb meals like they're not best for your physique in the long run is that if just to sum up what you're gonna feel heat uh, yeah. one, uh, genetics most probably yes so i will tend for more of a ketogenic breakfast ketogenic Post workout, if you think more in a Ben Pakowski approach regarding nutrition, you will go more for a back carb loading, you know? Mm -hmm. But you will know because if you have a carb before training and you're good, and if you don't have carb before training and you're astonishingly very strong, then you know you're, you're fine with back bar, carb. So it depends your energy expenditure yeah. when you work out, and that's very yeah. important. Yeah, I don't find personally, I don't find like a difference. As long as there's some type of energy in me, I don't find there's a difference. Like if I use. No, you, you're not. telling me now, I'm a great genetics. You can do a ketogenic, low carb, high carb, uh, target keto, uh, whatever. Everything will work on you, which is great because any coach will work on you. They will get what they expect. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying like I looked like <laughs> terrific or anything. I'm just saying my workout. Yeah. 
doesn't really change. Like I can lift and be strong with very little carbs and I, I don't really, yeah, but, I have uh, more carbs. I'm not like, you, I'm sure you coach a lot of people and you won't find that scenario on all spectrum. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're right. You're right. I'm just, I guess I'm just kind of saying like, well, what about like the people like me where they're like, well, I don't really find a difference. I think the, the biggest factor, you know, to that point is because it's what you believe, right? If you believe that you need carbs to train, then that's what's going to happen with your body. If you believe that you can have a good workout without carbs, then that's what's going to happen to your body. So I think, you know, uh, even uh, up and above, like, you know, the physiological responses, like the psychological, physiological mm -hmm. connection too. So, you know, like, I always believe that if you don't have carbs before you train, you're not going to have the pump, you're not going to whatever have, you know, be able to build muscle or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but then actually trying just having like protein and fat before training. We talked about this uh, before when we were talking to Aaron, right? And yeah. Like, those are some of the best workouts I had because uh, I wasn't getting any uh, serotonin from the carbs. So I was, I was training with just dopamine because it was fats and proteins. And so, you know, my whole workout was like really dialed in and focused. And, you know, it's not, not to say that you can't be focused with, you know, carbohydrates pre-workout. Obviously you can, but it, it just comes down to like what you believe. Yeah. More, more than anything. Okay. It has a good dimension to it. You know, I'm, I'm a big uh, uh, advocate of the, the, the somatic layer and the perceptual and the symbolic layer of how you enact uh, reality and physical reality i will not bend only to find uh, to science i cannot see the self and the fact being the leader of who i am you know but that makes me a very esoteric practitioner but i never hide from that so so, so we know that that gh and, and igf and insulin are not the only reasons or are, are not that the 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 biggest reason why a waste would grow there's there's lots of other reasons. yeah we have all the yeah. Okay, so let's let's go through some of, let's go through some of the, some more of these. We've, oh, so, we've kind of touched on some of them. What about estrogen? Estrogen was one of the things that you said kind of has potential to blow out a waste. How does that happen? Talk to me about that. Well, are there a lot of estrogen, estrogen receptors in the stomach? Very, or? Estrogen is a very misunderstood hormones into bodybuilding. Uh, I'm. I see the interaction between estrogen and cortisol and estrogen and testosterone as an essential of cognition, memory, uh, bone, libido, drive, motivation. Uh, it has lots of assets. You have to be careful. That's why I said estrogen blood control analysis. Because let's say you're four weeks out of a contest and let's say you're doing X, Y, Z, which is too much you uh, input an insulin resistance because you're abusing anti-estrogen. Yes, you will have a, a tight waist, but that protocol will not be good in four, five years. So you better have an accuracy of a blood panel test related to your estrogen. Uh, of course, it has an influence on the estrogen rate uh, testosterone ratio, which, you know, someone has, someone that has low testosterone and low free testosterone as age, the fascia, the elastin, the body would go and the waist would, you know, if, and if they do an ART, an older guy, then the waist would reduce. So there's an, there's a, there's a, there's an interaction there. It's quite complex, but I will say that if your estrogen is in harmony, not too high, not too low, you will have normal libido. You will have a libido that doesn't affect your, let's say, organized life or organized mind. Or it will not, too much libido or too low libido is not good. Of course, it's your partner has somewhat of a, has to be compatible with your uh, normal level of estrogen somehow. But you will know in aggression, you know, is often we eat the archetype of the man is aggressive, but try steal a baby from a woman. You will see what aggression is. A woman will kill you more than a man. Mm -hmm. So you know what I mean is estrogen is, you will see aggression, not in supraphysical uh, dosage of testosterone. I see guy at three gram of test, 
super cool, bro. You can even like laugh at them. They'll be like very friendly. But if their estrogen is whack, too low, too high, they snap. Yeah. That's true. That's very, very cool. true. It's very, very true. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that, you know, estrogen does have cardioprotective and, and uh, protection against osteoporosis as well. So it's yeah. not like you want to always strive for the lowest amount of estrogen. Yeah. It That's helps with our bodybuilders you know? should do, should make sure they have a decent waist. Because if your waist get overboard, some it could be hard to bring it back. It could be, it could lead to much work at the end, more suffering, more yeah, yeah. extreme measure. Yeah. So in, in the end, last week of like last weeks in a prep, and you're trying to get, you know, your waist as tight as possible. What do you say about that then? Like for like you know the 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 protocols of a bunch of anti-estrogens and um, uh, anti-estrogens and estrogen blockers. What do you say? Like, is that, are we doing it wrong or what's your opinion? What's your thoughts? You mean, you mean at the end of a prep? Yeah. The estrogen. Like would... leading into a show, like yeah. last, like five weeks. Okay. So from five weeks is a bit pushing, but let's say at three and a half weeks, with estrogen, you don't have extreme contest leg condition. With estrogen. With estrogen. So yeah. you smash legs till you have condition of legs. And when you have condition of legs, your estrogen is very, very low. Okay. It's very hard unless you're in complete blood panel test that's perfect and you have this very harmonious homeostasy, you will have very lean legs mm -hmm. without using any anti-estrogen, which happen on, you know, the, let's say the best genetics. But if you dabble with pre-workout and ephedrine and you overdrive the adrenaline, you know, if you train with pre-workout for seven years, and then the neurotoxicity will, will induce aromatization and you'll have higher estrogen, not because your estrogen went actually high, it's because your lifestyle induced estrogen mismanagement, which has to make you more going wild at the end of the contest. But if you're capable of modeling an off-season with very minimal anti-estrogen or do gynecomestia, and you don't have any symptom or side effect from estrogen, and then you loop at the end that where you smash it, that's yes, it's not healthy to smash estrogen, but at the same time, it's only for three, four weeks. And at the same time, is it will rebound naturally once you stop, almost right away. And, uh, and then you know that it's a temporary measure. Can you do contest uh, leg condition without anti-estrogen? I doubt so. You see it in natural show that even the best natural in the world, you know, yes, we have lines, but doesn't look like, you know, Kai green legs, you know, when you have cross creation on your quads, it's impossible to do that for natural. Yeah. But when you, okay. So you said when you train, like there's no, like if you smash your legs. Um, what I mean by smash yeah. is my mean to say, let's say you do uh, literal novo AM PM, you bring your estrogen so low that the legs will pop. Oh, okay. But so yeah, you're, I mean, by smash is smash like, it's it's under what's functional but oh, okay under function for truth okay function. sorry i i got so, that completely messed yeah. up i thought you were saying like if you train them and then they become cut like that that means that there's no estrogen now i was really throwing no, no, that no. i'm like i think there's more it's estrogen i thought there'd be more the, the estrogen is that i'm gonna say something about that is if you train extremely hard you will bring lactate training which induce lots of growth hormone natural growth hormone exogenous endogenous mm. gh and it will break lactate in the brain which will detox redux brain you know it's it's like a ways that clean up the body and mm. that will lower cortisol and that will lower water retention so there's mm. a good advantage to hit to hard training to extreme training to mm. very like you know radical measuring like uh, let's say deadlift cardio 200 reps in yeah. kind of training yeah yeah, I'm. I was so I'm. I'm thrown off by that because I've been always like from studies and whatnot, seeing that you know training 
induces estrogen and cortisol as like a stress response, right? And that's why you don't train like a couple of days out from contest because you, you know, spikes cortisol, then there's some water retention, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a very acute response though, I think. Short-lived. Yeah. I mean, we... we yeah, I but he's saying, but Benoit just was saying like, it doesn't though. It flushes, it, the, the, the it thing flushes it, out, right? Yeah, but that's a, that's such a, a very complex question, but because it's case by case history, uh, calorific intake, uh, uh, body composition. But what I'm saying is near the end, you have to make sure that the glucogen is in muscle to look at its fullness. So if you do five day depletion, hardcore training, and you have one day rest to replenish glucogen, well, that day should be, that's BLP, low protein because you don't need protein synthesis. You don't need that much fat. You need some fat ratio one zero because that will give cellular volume. And then you put high clean carb up because that way your glucose will go. And because you go from hyperactive to let's say uh, isocaloric to a higher intake of carbohydrate to glucogen to muscle and uh, uh, GLUT4 signaling, then you'll fill up muscle and the person will look at his best in the rest day post depletion. Mm, okay. And the thing is, how hard you can go to depletion? Can you go depletion that you just feel small? Or can you go depletion that you don't know where you're at? Or can you go at depletion that, oh, I cannot have an organ, I don't function, I can't sleep anymore, I feel my immune system, it's crap. I'm all But that's a bad that's that's a bad place to be, you're saying, right? If like if yes you and like no. if you're yes and no, because listen to what I'm gonna say is if you have to go to your struation, struation, striation, can you go glute striation feeling well? I don't think so. I mean, you could once you're in a carboglucogen volumization, which is a temporary effect, but will we'll kind of bring adrenaline and dopamine. But to reach you that depletion, you have to reach that kind of level of suffering that makes a man a contest or that makes for some people quit the contest. Mm -hmm. They're not less of a man. They just cannot do it. Mm -hmm. So what I mean is you deplete to a wild uh, dysfunction and once you have two, three balls of meal, your heart rate comes back, you go bathroom, everything's worked, the smile is back, your memory is back, your, everything is back. So, the power of adaptation is immediate. So basically, if your dick can get hard, you're doing it wrong, is what you're saying. <laughs> at, at three weeks out, if you have libido and you can have sex with your girl, Yeah. You're either abusing of hormone in a ridiculous, dangerous level. Yeah. Or, or you haven't suffered enough. You're, you, you're, you have so much anxiety that comes your objective, subjective release. And it's kind of a intellectual pathology somehow. But if you're, let's say, normal, I mean, it's a, it's a weird word, but let's say you're just normal and you don't have that much libido, I will consider that smart and great and just normal. I think when you're like two, three weeks out, it's like, you know, you're so lean at that point that your body's not worried about, you know, procreation. Your body, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your body is just thinking survival. You, mm -hmm. You're almost more attracted to food than you are to like the other yeah. sex at that point. You're like yeah. look, looking at food pictures like it's porn at that point, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's just, you're, you know, your, your brain has changed. You know, he's been there, he's been there. He's talking about- He was like, oh, that brain. banana looks so good. Oh my God. A cheesy pizza. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about for women though? Because because women, you know, they obviously don't have you know the ability to get hard on to anyways, but they have to get to the point where it's so extreme that they feel like they're dying too, and they do have that problem where, where it's like if they're not using uh, anti estrogens. Oh, well, they could. They could. I mean, yeah, is fine. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is they they almost need to use it, to get to the level of like uh, the you know, Sydney Gillians and. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, the, the Laporia Watts, the Sydney Gillians, uh, yeah, those high exactly. If, if you want straighted glutes as a woman, you almost there's almost no way you can do that without anti estrogens, I would believe. Uh, yeah, 
unless you're just a crazy freak but but even then i think even with crazy freaks it's like they they tend to get you know like when women build a lot of muscle on their legs it doesn't end up being like striations yeah it's like, harder it's actually harder for them like i find yeah, to they, get to like get they, cuts they in nice, them nice, nice and round and, and full and hard but it's not to the point where it's like striations everywhere. yeah i've, I I've definitely find out body, from coaching the bigger like the thicker a girl's legs are um the harder it is to get them conditioned yeah and and sometimes with with women because you know they they also have the influence of uh progesterone as well and if they have you know high progesterone and low estrogen uh to begin with then they'll have you know a hard time building their legs it's like they're gonna have like the skinny leg uh kind of skinny arm skinny leg and like more of like a around midsection look if they have high progesterone and low estrogen so you know uh, hormone balance plays a big role for female uh, athletes as well for sure yeah. What about and, what if, and other women? Progesterone could be actually more of a mood enhancer, relaxer, relaxing, bring them yeah. home. DHEA, you know, if they need to seek for a serotonin, they would feel better that way. Mm -hmm. What about eating yeah. too fast? You said that that's another one of your points yeah, about like going out ways. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Is that just like from? Is that just like you're like from years? There's just like gas from eating eating too much and expanding your stomach, or does that tie in? Because another one of your things was um, uh, parasymp. What where is it? Uh, the 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 uh, vagal to tone parasympathetic work. I guess those two can kind of like would kind of tie into each other. No. Well, the thing is, you you're supposed to eat when you're relaxed. You don't watch TV, mm -hmm. you because TV will change, you know, the, the perceptual system of your uh, neurotransmitter. That's why it's bad eating in front of TV. And you don't eat when you're stressed. You know, if you if you just finish a training, you're you know you've been hyper and very you wait that your we talked about that yeah your, your sympathetic tone comes down and then you eat so it's more of a it's more of a regulation of habits to eat in a in a sense of I'm feeling my teeth I'm feeling my mouth I'm feeling my chewing I'm it's almost like create a mindfulness state while I'm eating to talk, it's it's very bad to be automatic. It's okay if you eat automatic at two meals a day, but if you eat automatic, automatic at a fast pace at five, 6,000 calories, like some bodybuilder, that, that would be a stress. That would be a major stressor. Hmm. Hmm. Um, <sighs> the dog's barking. Yeah, I know Robin's chasing, Robin's chasing, chasing you away. Um, is that something that you find often, like it, that you find often, like that from people you work with that they're eating too fast? I think a lot of people just. You, I, I think most, most, most. Sorry to cut you off. Most bodybuilders tend to eat too fast because when you get so, you know, let's say Masteron and Trend and Primo and Primobol and Proviron and this and that, there's kind of an adrenaline drive. Mm -hmm. And that's where you kind of be, remind yourself that you're an enhanced athlete and you're kind of fully adrenaline uh, going on to a level that maybe there's some social distortion or social uh, habits that happen into your your mechanic and your interaction with the outside world. And that's why you have to say, you have to repeat yourself, oh, I have to eat mindful because I'm an enhanced athlete, which drives my adrenaline by a lot, especially if you're using a moderate to you know high cycle. And Mike and I were talking about this before. It's like just, you know, getting the habit of uh, just like having a little prayer before you eat. So you can, you know, from whatever you're doing, you know, you're rushing around, you're like, okay, I gotta get my meal in. Just take a breather, you know, close your eyes, think about what you're going to do. You know, you don't, you don't even have to be grateful for the food that you're eating like six times a day, but just, you know, be grateful for something, change that kind of, that state of mind from like, you know, being like stressed to not being stressed and then eat that food and try to, you know, leave your phone somewhere else, try to turn off the screen. Uh, I always got the best results like on a prep when I'm like reading a book while I'm eating. Like if I have a book and I'm reading and then I'm not, you know, like, rushed to get yeah. through that meal it's just i'm sitting here and i'm going to enjoy this meal and you know especially you know it's funny because 
then I would even start to eat my food with like chopsticks, you know, just because on prep, you know, you're hungry, right? So you're like, I want this food to last longer. So you and so eating, eating with chopsticks is, is forcing you to eat slow. And then reading a book is just forcing you to chill out and read. So you're not, you know, you're not putting yourself. Great, great, yeah. great trick. Great that great is trick. really, really cool. That is re- a really, really cool trick. I'm going to have to try and remember that one. Um, aspartame and food colorant. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, the BCAAs and EAAs, I don't know if you kind of. Well, we don't, we all do on flavor. All my athletes are, they go on flavor one. Unflavored, there's, right? Uh, yeah. There's, yeah. There's, there's a any serious company don't use like candy store flavor. Yeah. Maybe they make money with that, but. I'm fine. I found that. I found that. I found that for for myself, man. Especially in the last bit, like it would just upset my stomach. I would like start throwing up and stuff like very like the last few weeks. And I I never thought it was gonna be like oh maybe it's like this BCAA that I just drink in the morning. I would drink it in the morning because I would take like all my vitamins if I'm taking Yohimbim or Clan or whatever, just to have something to sip on that like is not bad per se. Yeah. in the mornings before when I do pre, uh, po, uh, fasted cardio. And then I just found out like, maybe I should stop drinking this. And as soon as I stopped drinking, I was like, Oh fuck. Like I can handle my food. Like I'm not throwing up anymore. I don't feel like shit. It was the weirdest thing. Cause the, you, the last thing that you think would like upset your stomach. Cause it's like, it's just like water, water. And like you people, are, I often look at it as like healthy juice, but it's, it's not. It's really shit. Oh, it's not. It's not. It's not. There's a. There's the, the. The problem of that is, it's not because it's a sugar polymer that even though it's it's uh, a zero carb, there's still a glycemic signaling that create craving for it. So you will see the people will say, oh, you know, since I tried that uh, BCA while I'm dieting, well, I'm sipping it all day. Is that weird? You know, or you know what? I, I really like glutamine. I didn't know it converted in sugar. I'm taking glutamine at every meal now. Wait, really? Yeah. Huh? Why is that? <laughs> because it converted into sugar, and you want to increase ghrelin, which bring appetite, which bring can technically lead you to some form of addiction per se. And even when you cut it off, you're missing it, and it takes you five days to really cut off the relationship with those. It's so like they say there's no free lunch, right? Like, you know, there, there's always a side effect. If it sounds too good to be true, there's something going on. I think, you know, that's true for most things. And with like sweeteners and stuff, it's not like, it's not like the sweetener's that bad. If you were having it like once a week, once a month, there probably wouldn't be an issue with it. But it's the fact that it's in your EAAs, it's in your pre-workouts, it's in your post-workouts, it's in your protein. And so, you know, when you consider how many powders you're taking with flavoring, it's like five, six per day, every day, that's that's so much like it's, yeah. it's an incredible amount of sweetener and then you also you know add it on top like the food colorings that they use like if you're drinking like whatever some blue stuff it's like there's blue food coloring in that right and that's affecting your microbiota and you know that's basically you know your third brain is that that gut system so yeah. you know it can influence more than just uh well i guess everything affects your physique in the long run but like that's you know communicating with your brain as well so it's like you know, yeah, it's been studied on children. It plays a role. Yeah, it definitely does. And I always try to cut sweeteners out um, at least four weeks out before a show and just make sure that I can like look my best. And it always yeah. works. Yeah. Um, hmm. I would say if you're going to have sweeteners at all, you know, because it's a reality that most, most people listening are going to have at least some form of sweetener, but at least don't have it with your food. Have it like, at a different time of the day, if you're going to do it at all. Would you say, uh, would you say it would make sense to actually have just like, cause there's that debate of like, well, just have real sugar. If you're going to have aspartame, do I just have the real sugar? It's not so, real. It's not realistic on a prep though. That's, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just asking like, what are your guys' opinion on it? What, like, what if, what does BLP think and what do you think? I, I would agree with that. Like just don't have any, don't have either, but like, I don't know. You know, what do you guys think, you know, if that, is there a time where you would say, yeah, you know what, go ahead and have, have a fucking Coke or. A- I, I think it's just a, it's just a, a cultural, uh, it's just a, a cultural perception, which has 
social link. You know, I can, I like to have dessert with my girlfriend. It's a sign of, mm -hmm. of love and commitment and intimacy. But I say, you know, my question is like, yes, maybe, but why you need sugar to do that when you can do it, you know, naked with your words and your hands and your tongue and your, you know, not the yeah, accessory, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, if you go in a park, I'm going to use an analogy for children. You go in the park and there's a park. There's a place you climb. There's a place you slide. There's a place you jump. Those places dictate you to, right, that you witness and you interact with. But if I bring your child to a forest, then he creates where he climbs, where he jumps, where he interacts. Who's going to be smarter mm -hmm. at the long run? Mm -hmm. The one that creates himself. Not, not using something, he's creating. It's a good you know, analogy. It's a good analogy for everything they interact with, especially food, because food psychology is what are you doing now? And when you're a once you're five, six weeks of a prep, there's no technical pleasure. The pleasure is the pleasure of the stature of your physique, mm -hmm. which collide to discipline, self control. And food psychology, and of course, it's the flaw of many people, and the flaw of excess. And some people, you know, it slowly killed them over time. You know? So that's that's why bodybuilder has to have time of food and time is like, okay, I'm five weeks out now. There's no more pleasure with food. I just eat for result because this is the result I have to do it and cleaner and easier and more uh, organized is food calorific intake meal a at that time with that quantity you can uh, create a strategy of extreme surgical precision it's like oh we're just going to take 20 grams there we're going to put 10 fat here and book you have the very micro personalized magic you can do a lot with very little yeah and as a reminder, sugar and sweetness is also addictive. So, you know, try to avoid that completely. And just, you know, if you need EAAs, get them unflavored. If you need protein yeah. powder, unflavored. Everything. I am, I am pretty addictive. I know. I know. I hear it all the time. So I'm not surprised about that. Sugar, chocolate, you know, yeah. pretty addictive. Um, <laughs> the, thing is, the, thing is, the thing is, how healthy you want your mental health when you're going to have those striation glutes. Yeah. You know, is how mentally stable you'll be in contest condition. Yeah. Less sugar you have in the 24 weeks prep, easier is going to be bearable. You know what? It's also like, um, it's like, it's like a gateway too. Cause I've, when I've worked with people who have a sweet tooth like that and they start feeding that sweet tooth, it's like, it starts with, uh, you know, the BCAs, and then, like you said, they're drinking it all day, and then that's not enough, so then they start, like, eating, like, you know, vitamin C tablets, like the flavored ones, right, and then they're eating, like, a whole bottle of that, and that's not enough, and then the only other thing to do from there is just go out and cheat, and then they go, and they just binge like crazy, it's like, it's a gateway, right, because once you start opening up those gates, it's like after a show, as soon as you have that first bite of food, it's like, nothing else matters, you just go crazy with that food, because then, you know, your brain is now focused on something else, so... Mm. Yeah. True, but that will hide depressive syndrome. That means that mm. technically you will have uh, several deficiency, both mineral and vitamin and uh, cofactor and phytonutrient that went off. And now you're replenish something that was lacking. Of course, it will come back to normal with time and sleep and recovery. But to go on a, almost like a, a bulimic, you know, like I'm starving to death, then I eat. If I, if you go to, you eat something and then you cry because you were missing the taste, <laughs> I would say that's probably the furthest down the rapid hole you can go. Yeah. After that, it's self-destruction. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that, cause that was, that was, that's what I was going to ask you. I was just going to ask you that question. Like, is there a point where, you know, you've suffered so much that it's actually holding your physique back and it's like, okay, you know what? It depends on how much you're in shape. You know, once you're a hundred percent, once you're a hundred percent, okay, let's say, uh, let's say uh, you, Mike Robin, were at uh, 36 hours of the show and he looks perfect and he looks like 
Olympia level quality, stellar condition, maybe. Is he gonna reproduce it on stage? Maybe yes, maybe no, maybe who knows. Everything can happen. But the fact that he's 100%, he can win at 94%. And even if he cheat, then the body should be able to take it. Unless he did cheat every three days all the time. And you know, it's just, he just have a super metabolism and he just gamble each time. And each time he, he's getting watery and then he gets lean, gets the watery, gets lean. When you gamble like that, eventually you will fuck. You will fucked up your contest. Mm -hmm. You better say, I didn't cheat at all in a long, long, long time. And then I have a slip and it will work. You might get sick from it because it's such a change on the narrow bio, neural biochemical uh, commission. It's like almost like what, what the body would say, what's that? You're gonna throw it up. You know? Someone that eats clean for a long time, eats crap, you feel very, doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's move on to type of carb and uh no let's go back a bit let's talk about biomechanics helmin hip hip elevation is that is that morphology or pathology when we're talking about that that's uh, that's morphology it's it's an exercise that you're on back your knees on the air and what you do is you, you do like almost like a snake with your spine okay there's no swing there's no compensation so what it does it, it, it creates your spine to work like this like a snake yeah. both yeah. forward and backward that's level one. Level two, Robin did it, and he did a video with it, is you go on your glutes, you put your hair and your knee in the air, all your limb in the air, and you go forward and backward only with your glutes muscle, not touching anything. Oh, he's making them cheeks clap. Yeah, that's very, <laughs> very hard. But what's great about that is you see the bowel mechanic of the person, you see the strength, you see that, you see, Especially at this size, it's just really impressive to see a big guy doing it. And most of general public cannot even do it. Yeah. Of course, on the floor, the level one is more doable. Yeah. But it's a very good neurophysical rehab, physio. You know, eventually you you have to induce mobility when you're a bigger guy. And if you induce, if you don't induce mobility, drill about 15, 20 minutes a day, especially when you're injured, you will always pay for it. So then how, but how does that help your, how does that help your, you know, your waist? How does that keep your waist the tight thing, or make it smaller? The thing is, if you lose mobility, you, you create guts restriction. Okay. If you have an open, <clears throat> open uh, vagal tone, stomach tone, abdominal wall fluctuation, you can connect well to lower and upper abs. You always train or most of the time doing deadlift, uh, bench, while you're feeling both your lower and upper abs in that core axis. Uh, you will help peripheral limb mobility, which help hips, axis, and belly. You, know? you will know if, if a girl trained often with uh, belt, she would have a mid lap abs distanciation and you will see no abs once she's lean. The abs will be gone because it was inhibited by a belt. And if you inhibit something, it's not used per se. It creates a false sense of protection, but it inhibits sensory information in terms of skin and, and mesoderm yeah. and endoderm and fascia. And uh, yeah, all to say that if you're lean enough to have mobility and if you do mobility drill to be, you'll be strong, mobile, flexible, and with function come aesthetic, you know? As you look at Flex Wheeler, he was moving better than just say Justin Compton. You know? Justin Compton was a big guy, but it was almost like a block. It was a very impressive block, but he was like a block. So you, you prefer a physique that has more mobility and flexibility and aesthetic. And, you know, Phil Heath is in a good range of that. Mm -hmm. And even Rami has 300 pounds. There is. His waistline is pretty 
decent for, mm -hmm. for monster of the science. And if you see Rami's like routine, he stretches every day, literally <clears throat> every day. He's that's like meticulous with that. Yeah. At that show, at that, at that, at yeah. that weight, as well. Yeah. Is that so? Is that that high, how high, how high men thing and the uh, biomechanics, hip elevation? Um, you discuss uh, in your article like breathing and abs. Is that doing breathing exercise with abs? Like, was that something that because I I tend to do this too because people I think dissociate so much from breathing from training. There's this dissociation. Like we know about breathing, but we don't. I don't think people know how much it like affects how muscles move, especially in like your spine, your sternum, your like the dissociation from your sternum to like even uh, glenohumeral rhythm and uh, the expression of what's happening at your shoulder. Um, uh, even like through, even like the hips, just like, uh, I think your psoas kind of runs past and like attaches to part of like your, um, your diaphragm. So breathing becomes like this, like this, key that like nobody really pays attention uh, pays attention to we just think of breathing of just like taking in an in an in air in oxygen and, and letting air out but there's actually like a functional component where like it changes your body we know this because of like you know the vacuum um is that something like you recommend too like do you think that vacuums work or yeah me at when once i'm three four weeks out i would always do kind of a breath work session when we Completely breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Too extensively that eventually the the the, the body dissociates from the physical, and then you interpret image, imagination, and you drive uh, narrative. You know, I remember we did a breath work with uh, Robin where I saw him on stage competing, and it was not him dictate this uh, perceptual image. It was. It was it was improvisation, so I think breath work. It's very important, not only in terms of mechanic, not only in terms of neurology and oxygenation. Oxy if I cut your hair, the hair in your neck, you don't breathe anymore, you die. So it's oxygen first, oxygenation into muscle, oxygenation into your brain by the nose, by the mouth, by your stomach. Very important for bodybuilding. If not, hematocrit goes up, red blood cell goes up, everything goes up, blood pressure goes up, and everything kind of goes berserk after that. So oxygenation is very side, esoteric, whatever. I think that athletes that does breath work or breath exercise or mindfulness or all those esoteric tendencies, they have a lot of advantage to be able to handle contemporary stressor while competing because competing is a financial struggle it's not actually a plus in relationship unless your wife is a is a bodybuilder and she understands what's going on or she's very very agreeable and she can yeah. kind of loop out or loop in your uh, unpredictable self that's why i said reading exercise living mindfully living wild animal at the gym and once hormone is out you're at home quieter more relaxed to build muscle the, the heart of bodybuilding is not only build muscle is to repair in a parasympathetic tone if you're anxious and chronic uh, you know uh, loss in past or present or or struggle then then i don't think it's happening optimally and and to mike's point too you brought up a good point about like what's functional like people think like you know, squats, deadlifts, and whatever, bench press or red press. That's not like what, like, humans are, like, you know, designed to do. We're designed yeah. to do, well, we're designed to walk and we're designed to breathe. Yeah. So if, if you have dysfunctions in the, those main things that we're, you know, as bipeds supposed to do, then, you know, how that's going to influence everything else you do. You've got to breathe, you got to walk, for sure. Yeah. We yeah. have uh, five minutes left, not even. So what's your what's your last point? What's your, which last point? There's still many to talk, but we cover a lot. We'll do a part two. We'll um, part two. Let's talk about let's talk about uh, type of carb. Type of carb, yeah. Uh, oh. Gluten and you know oatmeal <laughs> and yeah, that sort of thing. It, Fibers. It, this is another kind of uh, very uh, controversial topic, but for me, it's not controversial. Is Everyone is gluten or celiac sensitive. Everyone on earth. It doesn't matter that 
You know, if you eat once, you will die. Nothing's going to happen. But if you eat a little bit every day for 30 years, that's probably why you will have immune modulation problem or uh, immune uh, thyroid function problem or immune uh, neurological uh, problem. So everyone that, I'm not saying gluten is the, the demon to, uh, you know, you need some now and then to at least be able to have antibody for it. So you don't cut it off completely forever. And it's very hard nowadays to cut your gluten, you know, because it's almost everywhere because we have to produce so much food. But at the same time, if you have, let's say you go in a pool and uh, you're allergic to uh, the, the chlorine. chlorine or whatever in it. Are you allergic to chlorine? Or it's because you had gluten for 20 years that made you allergic and prone to whatever is not right or out of nature a bit. So some people, they will blame the chlorine, but it's not the chlorine. It's your stomach in his microbiota that has histamine react, reactionary intelligence. And there's cross immune function related to gluten that will make you allergic to X, Y, Z. So if you have someone that's allergic to a substance that has no reason, it could be, if you're open to it, emotional. Let's say you eat a, a, a sandwich of tomato while fighting your girl and she hit on you. Next time you hit tomato, maybe your body will say, tomato hit, I don't like it. You create kind of a body association. But what I mean by that is if you're allergic to stuff that you don't understand why, mm -hmm. well, gluten could be the reason up. And if you clear that, not all year basis, but have it now and then, let's say nine, 10 weeks, zero, soldier war, zero, and then you have once in the blue moon, you'll be fine and get rid of all of those. It's better to get rid of gluten or to use uh, uh, antibiotic for the rest of your life because you have specific atypical allergy that we cannot explain. It's yeah. like a spectrum, right? It's yeah. Like, it affects everybody, but to certain degrees. And it was kind of like what I was telling you, Mike, before, what, uh, what Benoit just explained about, like, you know, your body associating, you know, different foods with, like, the emotional response or even yeah. getting yeah. Uh, inflammation but you response. Know, so you see in, uh, let's say, Alzheimer, tremor, uh, dementia, the, the, that's, that's 40, 50 years of daily gluten. Not, not exclusively, but for, let's say, someone that doesn't take drugs, don't drink, don't do that, and have to look at your the thing is today i think i said it before in your podcast you choose your poison so i want to choose the poison of masteron and primobolin and proviron i know how toxic it is so i'll make sure the rest of my life my nutritional intake and my lifestyle can at least be in tune and i'm mature enough as a man to have chaos and order into a regimen of self-control with enhancement and i'll be smart with it and it's something that is like a gift. It's a gift to yourself, it's a gift to your physique. But if you do it uh, eating whatever, well, it's going to give whatever. It's, uh, you have people that win pro card being lazy, but winning Olympia lazy or make it to the Olympia lazy, I really don't. So unless you're Chris Cormier that likes to party a bit and you know bodybuilding, but he's one of the few. Yeah. And so what, what kind of carbs does that leave us with? It still leaves, with a, with, leaves us with a lot of different Yeah, carbs you, have to, you have to look at gluten. You have to look at celiac. You have to look at zonulin. You have to look, you know, just do, eat whatever you want and go see an IG test to see your IgM, IgC, IgA, IgF. Then you see your immunoreactive, uh, especially if you're a bodybuilder, especially if you have a children that's like of a, Let's say you have a teenager that goes in school and has problems in school, then you could really do, do an allergic test and then you could really calm down the nervous system and the focus instead of giving them Adderall and uh, Italian to go uh, being sit down. You can also like pay attention when you know when you eat something and you get bloated, well, you probably yeah. shouldn't eat that. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah. like, like, you know, listen to your body too. You know, your body has you know, this feedback that it gives you for a reason. It's telling you something. Just listen to it. 
Okay. Um, let's wrap it up. I got to go, but before I go, before we hang up, because we have to go work out, when you eat before and after, it has to be neutral. So you don't feel crushed, you're not tired, you're not, you're not, you're not more hungry for food. You're, it's, it's just like a flow. Yeah. yeah. And if you flow in and out of no energy expenditure, that four local circadian on your sleep and at night, you have a good nutrition plan for life. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you so Thank much you, for joining bro. us on Buried, Buried Under the Bar again. We've got to, we're going to have to have you and finish up talking about these last few points another time. Yes, sir, bro. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good workout, guys. Take care and stay buried under the bar. Guys, um, if you uh, can give us a follow, uh, Benoit, um, he's uh, Benoit LaPierre. He's uh, definitely on Instagram as well. Uh, Robin Strand, myself, we're on iTunes or on Spotify. Give us a follow, give us a like, comment below, and let us know if we could answer any other questions for you. Thank you and take care. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for watching. Thank you.